we will keep all participants muted and please keep your video turned off throughout the presentation. Um, if everyone could go ahead and open the chat box and send us your name and the city you are calling from, that would be greatly appreciated so that we can have a good understanding of our listener demographics. Also during the presentation, if you have questions, you can type them into the chat box and I will try my best to relay, relay them to the speaker during the presentation. And at the very end, we will also have a few minutes for remaining questions. As I mentioned, I work for the Grand Traverse Conservation District, and I wanted to share a bit of our background and what we do here, and then I will hand it off to Carol. Uh, the Grand Traverse Conservation District was established in 1941 and historically was started as a valuable tool during the Dust Bowl era for farmers to learn better cultivation practices. And today, the same idea is still heard throughout our mission while at the same time it has been expanded to include a wide range of programming, including our Boardman River Nature Center, in order to instill and promote the idea of conservation into all generations. We were previously an unfunded entity until 2018 when the people of Grand Traverse County voted to give us a millage, which has helped tremendously in our day-to-day -day operations. Um, yeah, we are truly blessed to have our district offices housed within the Boardman River Nature Center on Grand Traverse County's Natural Education Reserve property. This is where most of our work stems from, housing MEEP, ISN, Parklands, and other programs. Our education department operates almost exclusively from the Nature Center, which includes camps and field trips for area youth to partake in and indulge themselves in nature and conservation by utilizing the several miles of trails located directly behind the center, right along the Boardman River. Uh, some of the things we do in line with our mission is restoration through management of invasive species with the Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network, instill and foster exploration of our natural world through our parklands program, which features 3,000 acres of public parklands throughout the county, and promote agricultural assistance through MEEP, which is the Michigan Agricultural Environmental Assurance Program. Another facet of our work is restoration and stewardship of Boardman River bottomlands and its associated watershed following the removal of three hydroelectric dams. Our district forester is Cam Ross, who works through the forestry assistance program to provide assistance for private landowners on woodland ownership. Produce safety guidelines for farmers are provided through our Michigan on-farm produce safety technician, Michelle Jacobs. There are a few ways in which the community can get involved with our work and mission such as volunteering at the Nature Center as a docent, simply promoting sustainable and responsible enjoyment of the outdoors, or participating in upcoming district events and programs, all of which can be found on our website under events and are currently subject to change in venue in light of COVID. Another way to become involved is to sign up as a trail steward. These are our eyes on the trails that report down trees, erosion issues, and other parklands concerns. Lastly, consider donating to GTCD on our website or becoming a friend of the district by visiting natureiscalling.org slash support. And that just about wraps up everything I've got to say about us. Again, thank you everyone for participating. And if you have any questions about the Grand Traverse Conservation District, please feel free to send us an email to info at gtcd.org. And from here, I will pass the mic on to Carol. Thank you, Luke, for that very informative summary of all the great work that the Grand Traverse Conservation District does. And thank also, you. Thank, thank you for moderating our program today. 
Yeah, no problem at all. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second annual Protecting Our Lakes and Shorelands Information Series, which we often refer to as the Poll Series. Also on the screen with Luke and I are, are my fellow organizers of the Poll Series, Patty Herzberger from Spider Lake and Ralph Bednars from Rennie Lake. Those are two lakes in the Northwest area of Michigan's Lower Peninsula. A little over two years ago, my friend and fellow riparian, Patty Herzberger and I, began discussing ways to connect experts in our Northwest Lower Michigan area with local riparians and other clean water or water quality supporters. Our primary goals were twofold. One, was to provide expert information to learn more or to provide information from experts for folks like us to learn more about our lakes and waterway ecosystems. And two, to encourage folks like us to take that information and make at least one change in our actions to support our local lakes and shorelands. This year, our audience has expanded from our local Northwest Michigan area to people attending from across Michigan and beyond. Among the registrants, 60 some registrants that we have, is someone from Kentucky and someone from Nova Scotia, Canada. What ex that expansion of participation is due to the Grand Traverse Conservation District offering to host our program. You see, last year, Katie Griesiak, the coordinator of the Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network, was one of the poll's speakers. When we went looking for a host this year for our poll series, Katie quickly and skillfully coordinated a connection with our poll's organizers and with the Grand Traverse Conservation District. We are most grateful to Katie and the Grand Traverse Conservation District for hosting us. Hey, speaking of last year, Ralph Bednars, who's on the screen with us, and he's a retired limnologist from Michigan. Last year, he attended that 2019 poll series. Patty and I are grateful that he offered to join our organizing team. He was instrumental in arranging our speakers for this year. Ralph? Will you please introduce our speaker for today? Yes, uh, thank you, Carol. I'm pleased to be part of the uh, 2020 poll series. One of the main lessons I've learned about Michigan's inland lakes during my career with the Department of Environmental Quality is that lake protection needs to be done at the grassroots local level, and it starts with education. I also learned that lakes with the most progressive lake management programs are the ones that have local champions working on a daily basis to educate and motivate the riparians to make a difference for their lake. Carol and Patty are the current champions for Spider Lake. I've met and worked with many special people in my career. We have three ta very talented people that I have the pleasure to call my colleagues scheduled to educate us during the 2020 poll series. The first is Dr. Joe Lattimore. Dr. Lattimore is an aquatic ecologist in Michigan State University's Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, based from her home here in Traverse City. She specializes in the protection and management of lakes, rivers, and the landscapes scapes that support them. As an outreach specialist, she works collaboratively with natural resource managers, communities, and the public to develop innovative solutions to the complex challenges facing aquatic systems. Her current work includes guiding Michigan's volunteer lake and stream monitoring program and developing creative approaches to prevent the introduction of the spread of aquatic invasive species. Dr. Lattimore has taught MSU courses on aquatic e ecosystem management science communication and aquatic entomology and teaches extension programs on such topics as aquatic plants, lake ecology, water quality monitoring, invasive species, and natural resource leadership. Dr. Lattimer enjoys spending time on the water 
in her free time as well, kayaking, snorkeling, and fishing Michigan's waterways. Please help us provide a warm Northern Michigan welcome to Dr. Lattimore. Joe, the virtual stage is yours. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna get my sh uh, screen shared here so you all can see my slides. Let's see here, that should do it. All right, thank you so much for having me here today um, and hosting me as the first speaker in your poll series for this summer. Um, it's exciting to be able to reach folks um, wherever they are um, during this unusual summer um, and uh, hopefully also keeps your the rest of your weekend free to go enjoy uh, maybe a local lake. So I wanna jump right in and start talking about our aquatic plants um, that we often like to refer to as Michigan's underwater forests. Um, there's a whole world under there that um, we often don't even notice. And so um, I've already been introduced and I, I deeply appreciate that. Um, so, you know, it's a little strange to not be right in front of you today and speaking with you, but um, I think that it's, uh, this is how we're gonna interact for the foreseeable future. Um, so, yep, my name is Joe Latibor. I'm at Michigan State University. I spent a lot of time out on uh, lakes and rivers around Michigan, um, and I'm particularly interested, uh, especially in recent years, in our aquatic plant life that we have. Um, I'm gonna be mentioning a number of different resources and programs throughout the course of this. Um, presentation and um, I've provided a list of links to our hosts and anyone who's registered for this program they'll, they'll send that out to you in an email um, with the email address you provided when you registered so um, don't worry about trying to write down links or names of programs um, if it's something you want to catch um, you'll be able to get it off that list and of course you're welcome to contact me at any time um, that's part of my job is helping support um, lake and stream management um, across Michigan and beyond. Um, Extension it has an ex extensive list of lake, stream, and watershed protection programs. Uh, everything from volunteer monitoring of our lakes and streams to leadership development to specific programs on things like shoreline protection, um, aquatic plants, invasive species, septic systems, and so forth. And uh, we've recently created a, a really nice interactive catalog that lists all of those programs. And you can visit um, Extension by just going to extension.msu edu to learn more about our programs. So let's start talking about aquatic plant communities. Um, as you might imagine, aquatic plants um, vary uh, partly based on the depth of the water. And so as you can see in this image, um, as we look at a uh, cross section of a lake, we really have three different types of aquatic plants. Um, one major type is the emergent type. Those are the plants that actually emerge out above the water surface. These are things like cattails, and pickerel weeds, and things that we'll see from the shoreline easily. Then we have things with floating leaves, plants like water lilies, where the leaves are floating right there on the surface. So we can see them um, when we're out on our boats, the leaves at least, you may not be able to see the stems or any other features. And then the plants that we probably notice the least are the submersed plants. These are the plants that grow entirely under the surface of the water, with the exception of potentially a small flower spike or, or other small reproductive structure. The bulk of the plant is under the water, and we probably won't see those unless we pull up our anchor and they're tangled all over them, or maybe you go swimming and feel some plants on your feet. Um, those are the submersed plants that we may not notice, but are really a fascinating and really important community in our inland lakes. Um, so the next uh, few slides, I wanna talk a little bit about the importance of aquatic plants. Because really, in a lot of ways, aquatic plants can get a bad rap. Um, people don't like their boat motors getting tangled or their kayak paddles, or if you're swimming, you feel something touch your feet, um, that can be a little disconcerting. Um, but really, they're really important to the health of our lakes. And one of the ways that they protect our lakes is by absorbing the energy of the waves and wind um, and keeping the lake itself stable. So if you look at this figure, what you're seeing is you can see wave energy coming from left to right. And if you had no plants on the bottom of your lake, what you might experience is a 
lot of turbidity, meaning um, muddy water, because there's no plants rooted there on the bottom to protect the bottoms from being stirred up. And so when the waves come in, it kicks up the sediment, it gets cloudy or even like chocolate milk um, because there's no plants holding it down. The water is less clear and you can even find erosion happening along the shoreline because that wave energy is just slamming up against the shoreline. And if you happen to own or uh, recreate on waterfront property, you may have seen that kind of erosion happening. And aquatic plants can help protect the shoreline from that. You can see here on the right when there's plants there, that those plants um, can absorb that energy and protect both the lake bottom and the shoreline from that energy. So you have clearer water and less erosion. Aquatic plants also provide very important habitat for the fish that live in our lakes and all sorts of other creatures too, like snails and the invertebrates on which fish feed, um, amphibians, uh, frogs, turtles, um, all of those depend on aquatic plants at some point in their life cycle. For example, you can see the image on the right of some bass cruising through a plant bed. Um, they'll be looking for the small prey fish that are hiding in that plant bed. A lot of fish nest in our aquatic plant beds, and um, so do frogs and other things. Um, you've probably seen dragonflies flying around, um, around emergent plant beds and so forth. And when we eliminate aquatic plants, we're eliminating habitat. And so, you know, anybody who has done any fishing at all knows if you want to catch a fish, you find that weed bed and you fish along that weed bed. And once that weed bed is gone, the fish are gone too. Plants also provide oxygen into the water. As everybody who studied, you know, elementary school photosynthesis, you know that plants can take sunlight energy, produce food, and they produce oxygen. And the same thing happens with underwater plants. And oxygen levels are really important in the water, again, for the fish and other creatures that live there. So having a healthy plant community also ensures that you have abundant oxygen in your lake. They also are taking up nutrients. Nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen are found throughout the planet and they're including in our lakes as well. And aquatic plants need those nutrients to live. Other things also use those nutrients, things like algae. And if we have a situation where um, we have plenty of aquatic plants, the water tends to be clear. Like you can see where this person who's snorkeling over a, a plant bed, the water is nice and clear, um, partly because of what we mentioned before, that that plant bed keeps the sediment from being stirred up. But it also prevents excessive amounts of suspended algae in the water. Um, what we sometimes see is something like what you'll see in this cartoon here, where on the top panel of the cartoon, we have a healthy aquatic plant community and the water is quite clear. There's always going to be nutrients in the lake. And if we get rid of the plants, like has happened in the lower part of this cartoon, what you see is um, the water's turned green uh, because the nutrients are still there. And if there's no plants to use them, the algae will use them. And so we upset the balance if we remove the aquatic plants from a lake and the suspended algae will take uh, advantage of the nutrients that are there. They're also beautiful. Um, if you've never had a chance to put on a mask and look below the surface of your lake, I certainly encourage you to. Um, aquatic plant communities are really quite gorgeous. Um, there's a lot of diversity down there. There's lots of little fish swimming around in there. Um, I've recently, in the last couple of years, really taken up snorkeling in our inland lakes and find that it's um, really a great way to appreciate the diversity of aquatic plants that live in our um, waterways. And I've proposed this to a lot of folks before to jump in and try some snorkeling and why sometimes from some uh, homeowners get kind of a sideways look of, are you kidding do you really want me to do that I say well if you don't want to do it buy a mask and fins for your grandkids and let them get in there and tell you about how cool it is under the water another thing that's really valuable is that a healthy native plant community can help provide resistance to invasive aquatic plants. We're gonna talk more about invasive plants in a couple minutes, but when you have a healthy um, uh, community of aquatic plants in your lake, it's less likely that an invader can get a foothold because there's just no space for it. So we often refer to our aquatic plants as an underwater forest. This beautiful image um, is, is pretty realistic. Um, you saw that underwater photo that I showed a minute ago. Um, a lot of different species there, a lot of fish and creatures living in there and making it so, you know, this family can go fishing and catch fish and, and enjoy their time out on the water. 
So as I mentioned before, when we looked at that cross section of a lake, um, there's really three major communities of aquatic plants that we talk about. Um, one is the emergent plants, um, like these uh, rushes that you see uh, coming up out of the water surface, cattails, arrowheads, spike rush, those are all different kinds of emergent plants. Now, I'm not gonna talk too much about them today because I really wanna focus on the underwater part of, of what we're um, talking about with aquatic plants. So we're gonna talk about floating leaf plants, um, things like water lilies and, and floating leaf pond weeds and so forth. And I'm going to start out talking about the really underwater plants, the submersed plants that we often don't even notice unless we put our face right down there near the water. But first, a little bit of terminology. Um, if you want to become um, fairly comfortable with identifying underwater plants, there's a little bit of terminology to learn, and there's a few features that you're going to want to look at um, to tell one species from the other. And this is just a basic um, terrestrial diagram showing some of those key features. Um, this is a simple leaf of a plant, um, just a, a cartoon of a plant here where you have the leaf blade, um, the tip of the blade, the margin or edge of the leaf. Um, there's veins that you can see, including this midrib that goes right up the center of the leaf. Um, the leaf stalk or petiole is an important characteristic in your aquatic plants. That's the part that connects the leaf blade to the stem. So the leaf stalk or petiole, I'll call it a petiole most of the time today. Um, and then the stem itself. Um, there's also features called stipules that can help you really get into telling some of the fine identification, um, but we're not going to dwell too much on some of those more complex features today. So now we'll look at some actual aquatic plants. So we're going to talk about groups of plants that have simple leaves, like this image here, where you just have a nice basic leaf attached to a stem. That's called a simple leaf. While a lot of our aquatic plants have finely divided, or um, sometimes called compound leaves, where this whole feature here is a leaf, but it's finely divided into a number of leaflets. And we'll see both of these plants again in a few minutes. The leaf margin or the edge of the leaf is also important. Um, in particular, is the edge of the leaf smooth, like this leaf? Or is it serrated or toothed, like this leaf? Those are a couple of very important features to look for when you're looking at aquatic plants to determine what kind you're looking at. The arrangement of leaves on the stem is also important to look at. And this, again, might be familiar to many of you. Um, here is an image of what we call alternate leaf arrangement, where we have the stem right here in the center, and then you have a leaf coming off on one side, and then you go a little further down the stem, and here comes a leaf off the other side. Um, they're alternating along the stem. And that is in contrast to what we call opposite leaves, where you have two or more leaves coming off the branch or the stem at the same point. So you have a leaf here, a leaf here. Two leaves are opposite. If you have more than two leaves coming off a point on the stem at the same point, we call that world. There's a world of multiple leaves coming off the stem at a single point. And then finally, sometimes there's no stem at all. And in that case, the leaves are considered basal. All the leaves are coming from right from the ground, basically. There's no stem. They're all attached right there at the base. So that's called basal. We also look at how the leaf is actually attached to the stem. Sometimes a leaf will be called clasping. And we've looked at this leaf a number of times already. And what you can see, here's the base of the leaf. And you can see the bottom of the leaf, the base of the leaf is actually clasping right around the stem. It's hugging it. Um, as opposed to a leaf with a petiole or leaf stalk, like you see in this image here. And then finally, a few plants have leaves that are called sessile, which means that they're right up against the stem. There's no petiole, but it's not actually clasping. It's just right up against it. So those are the three categories there. Um, and then occasionally you'll want to look at the veins. You'll be looking to see if there's clear veins that you can see. Is there a major midrib in the center of the leaf? And in some cases, you'll even be asked to count veins. We're not going to dig in that deeply today, um, but if you look at some of our plant keys that are out there to help you identify species of plants, you may need to count the veins. A couple of other features to look for, we've already talked a little bit about that mid vein that can be really important, um, whether you can clearly see a mid vein in the leaf or not. And then the leaf tip or apex. Here's a real needle shaped apex right here, just a generally pointy one. This one's kind of round with a few little teeth. So looking at the tips of the leaves can also be helpful. 
there's a number of really nice books to help us identify aquatic plants um, in our lakes. Um, and I'll list a few here. And again, links on how to get these books um, will be shared with you after the, uh, the webinar. Um, MSU Extension put together a Michigan Boaters Guide to Selected Invasive Aquatic Plants. This is a really nice guide for those who are primarily interested or concerned about invasives in their lake. Um, it's got really nice photos. The book is water resistant, so you can take it out in, the, in your boat with you or out on the, on the beach. And um, it's a really handy, helpful um, tool for, for Michigan in particular. Um, another one, if you want to dig in a little deeper, and this is probably my favorite. Um, this is Aquatic Plants of the Upper Midwest. You can get it through the University of Wisconsin's Extension Program. And the photographs in this book are amazing. Um, they're very uh, excellent photos of the features, very good descriptions, there's keys, and um, it includes pretty much every aquatic plant you might come across um, here in Michigan. So this is a really nice guide as well. And I also, a final one I'll recommend is called Through the Looking Glass. This one's also through the University of Wisconsin Extension. Um, it's not a photographic guide. It actually has drawings of the plants, but this one gets into more detail about the ecology of each plant, the role that it plays in its function in your lake, um, and gives you a bit more description. So this is a really nice reference to have as well, and the drawings are very excellent. All right, let's meet some plants. Um, so we're gonna go through them in categories. And the first category we're gonna look at, as I mentioned before, are the plants that live fully beneath the water. So the submerged plants. And among those submerged plants, the first plants we're gonna look at are those with simple leaves. And what will be interesting is to, as you're watching and listening to, to the webinar today, is to think about, you know, thinking about your time on lakes around you. Have you ever seen this plant before? Does it look familiar? Because I'm guessing you're going to see a lot of familiar faces as we go through here. The first one I want to mention is water. Um, Wow, I've got the wrong name on here. This is actually called water celery. I've got a typo in my presentation, my very first slide. Um, it's right here, water celery is what we're looking at here. Um, and water celery uh, is a basal plant. Remember we talked about basal plants not having a stem. All the leaves come right from the root system and grow up. I bet you a lot of you have seen this plant in your lake. I know I've seen it in Spider Lake a number of times. And sometimes people will call it eelgrass or um, tape grass um, because it looks like long straight ribbons. And then if you're out at the right time of year, you may also see the flowering stem. Um, it looks like a coil or a spring and it floats all the way up to the surface and then at the top will be a tiny white flower. This image here that I have, the flower has, has already faded. Um, but these are the flowers that float to the surface because uh, this plant can grow in quite deep water um, and do its, its seeding and reproduction there at the surface. Um, you may also be familiar with this plant because it does tend to uproot, especially later in the summer and wash up on people's shores. Um, this is a really valuable native plant in our Michigan lakes. Um, the roots and tubers that it produces are important food for waterfowl and it provides a lot of habitat for fish and invertebrates in, in our lakes. Here's actual water weed, another uh, submersed plant with simple leaves. Looks a lot different. Um, what you can see here is you definitely have leaves attached to a stem. Um, and then there's small leaves. You can see here's a group of three that have been, we've kind of cut them off of a stem. There's a whorl. Remember we talked about whorls where, where you have more than two leaves coming off the stem at a single point. Um, and this is a very common aquatic plant in our native um, Michigan lakes, a native plant in our Michigan lakes. Um, however, it looks very similar to an invasive species, um, hydrilla. Um, in Michigan, we're actually fortunate to not have any known invasions of the plant hydrilla in our lakes yet. But if you look at that map in the corner of the image, you can see dots that show where hydrilla has been found. The bigger the dot, the bigger the infestation of this invasive plant that's not native to, to North America. Um, and there's a few key characteristics that help you determine um, whether you're looking at elodea or hydrilla. Um, one of them is the fact that the edges of the leaves Leaves are serrated or toothed. Remember we talked about how that's important to, to know to look at the edges of the leaves. Um, we're also going to see, um, here's a comparison of Elodea right next to Hydrilla. Um, Hydrilla tends to have four, five, or even more leaves at each whorl, while Elodea tends to have only three and is much smoother. 
So um, that's an important distinction. Here's another example. Here is Elodea and here is Hydrilla. There's a lot more leaves at each whorl. And in this image, it's a little hard to tell, but they do have teeth while the Elodea do not. Hey, Joe. Yes. I do have one question from Ralph. He asks, sure. how important are aquatic plants in mitigating the effects of the current high water levels in our inland lakes? Sure, that's a great question, Luke. And um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, uh, the way that aquatic plants can help us um, help our lakes resist wave energy. Um, that's particularly important under high lake levels, um, which where a lot of us are experiencing right now. Um, having aquatic plants stabilizes the lake bottom. It protects the shoreline from erosion. And even as our water levels get higher, those plants will stay there and they'll continue to thrive. And they'll, they'll protect, um, they'll provide some level of protection against that wave energy um, coming in, which can be particularly damaging um, during high water water uh, situations. Thanks for that great question. Cool. All right, let's move on to another group. Um, this is another group of submerged aquatic plants that has simple leaves and it's the pond weeds. And there's over 29 um, uh, species of pond weeds in our Michigan lakes. Um, most of them are in the genus Potamogeton. Um, there's a few that are under the genus Stuchenia, um, but we're going to group them all together as um, pond weeds. And fear not, I'm not going to go through all 29 of them, um, but I just want to give you some basic um, hints on how to tell if you're looking at a pond weed or maybe something else in your lake. So there's three features of pond weeds um, as a group that they all share. Um, and as they're listed here at the bottom, first of all, as we already know, they all have simple leaves. Second, the leaves are always in an alternate arrangement. So if you look at the stem, there'll be one leaf coming off at one point, then another leaf coming off, and then another leaf. They're never in opposite or world arrangement. And the third thing that you'll see, and you can see in this image here on the screen, is that there's a really apparent mid-vein that's present. Um, sometimes you need to hold it up to the sky. Don't hold it up to the sun and hurt your eyes, but towards the sky, and you'll be able to see those veins really clearly, and a mid-vein will be really apparent to you. So simple leaves, alternate leaves with a mid-vein present, and you have a pondweed. Many, um, there's a whole group of species of narrow-leaved pondweeds, and here's just a, a random example of one that I picked um, that kind of looks a little grassy. If you were to spread out the stem on a, on a, a table or a, a flat surface, you'd see that the leaves are clearly alternate. You can kind of see that here where you have a leaf, then a leaf on the left, then one on the right, one on the left. Um, these are narrow-leaved um, pondweeds. There's quite a few species of these in Michigan lakes. Um, one that we see a lot is sago pondweed, um, and here is a picture of a bunch of it growing in a lake um, is, and a, a zoomed in photo of one spread out on a nice um, white background so you can see it very well. And again, you can see alternate leaves coming off at the stem, and what we're seeing here is the reproductive structure. So we're, we've got some um, fruit here. Um, there were flowers here. Um, this part will come up to the surface, and as you can see in the photo, sometimes in shallower water, sago pondweed and other pondweeds will grow right up to the surface of the water and you'll be able to see it um, right there very easily. This is a very common native um, pondweed in Michigan lakes. We've got uh, two more questions here real quick. Okay. First one from Richard asks, what about curly leaf pondweed invasive question mark? Oh, we're getting to that. So hold on. Okay. <laughs> it's coming. And then the second question is from Carol. Uh, do some pondweeds tend to have a sandpaper-like texture on their leaves, and if so, why? Yes, yeah, sometimes you will feel that, especially on the broader-leaved um, pondweeds that will, um, like this one we just saw um, previously, this one here. Sometimes you can almost see even on this one, it almost looks like the leaves might be coated or crusty a little bit. Um, and that's typically a substance called marl. It's calcium carbonate that's in the water, uh, very common um, in Michigan waters and the water chemistry in our lakes. Um, and actually some of the um, chemistry of the plant itself tends to make the calcium deposit on the leaves of uh, aquatic plants. And so you'll pull them up and sometimes they will feel like sandpaper or a little crusty. Um, you can scrape it off with your thumbnail. Um, it'll come off on your hand sometimes. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just a natural um, uh, response to an interaction between the chemistry of the plant and the chemistry of our water. Great question. Thank you. 
All right, um, here's some of the broader leaved um, pondweeds that you'll see in our lakes. A couple examples, there are several. Um, Illinois pondweed on one side and long leaf pondweed on the other side. Um, again, you can see alternate leaf arrangement. Um, you can also see a clear mid vein on the leaf. Here's a good example right here. You can see here on the long leaf pondweed right here. Um, you can see a petiole right there, that leaf stalk on this one, and then this one actually has a really long petiole. Longleaf pondweed is known for having really long petioles and also fairly long leaves compared to other pondweeds. Um, this actually helps it grow in streams and flowing waters because it'll stream along and the leaves won't get torn off because they're too wide, um, but you'll also find it in lakes. Ah, here's our curly leaf pondweed, just as I promised. Um, there is an invasive pondweed and it's called curly leaf pondweed. Um, and you can see from these photos how it gets its name. Um, the leaves have um, a rippled edge. To me, it looks like a lasagna noodle um, to make it pretty easy to recognize. And the other feature that it will have is the toothed or serrated leaf margin. Um, curly leaf pondweed will always have teeth and it's the only pondweed that has teeth on the edges of the leaves. So if you find a pondweed and you're concerned it might be curly leaf pondweed, because some of them will have a wavy leaf, not as, as wavy or rippled as curly leaf, but it can be a little confusing sometimes. Take a picture or a, get a hold of that plant, look at the edge of the leaf really closely. Um, if it doesn't have teeth, then we're safe. That's a native pondweed. But if you see those teeth on there, and you might have to look close to see them, then you're dealing with curly leaf pondweed. Curly leaf pondweed um, is, is throughout Michigan, uh, unfortunately, um, but the good news is in a lot of places where it has established, it hasn't become a huge problem. So what we recommend to people if they find curly leaf pondweed in their lake is to keep an eye on it. Um, if it spreads a lot, then, then management may be something you want to think about, but in some lakes you only have a few small patches or it grows amongst native plants and it really doesn't cause uh, many problems. So if it's growing out of control, that's one thing, but um, in many cases it actually doesn't. So that's that's some good news for this invader. Some of, some of our pond leaves, uh, pond weeds, are the ones that I showed before with the clasping leaf. Um, here's a picture of what we call clasping leaf pondweed, where you see the base of the leaf is wrapped right around the stem. Um, there's even one called profoliate pondweed, which is actually overlapping and making a little cup around the stem. Um, and then white stem pondweed is also quite common. It just barely clasps the stem. And um, as I mentioned about curly leaf pondweed, you look at this white stem pondweed and you might say, oh, I see ripples on the edges of these leaves. Um, should I be concerned this is curly leaf pondweed? But if you look at the leaf closely, you would see there's no teeth on the edges of those um, leaves. So it's a native and you're in good shape. All right, let's move on. Um, let's look at some of the submerged plants that have finely divided leaves. And this is one of my favorites, the bladder warts. Um, did you know we had carnivorous plants in our lakes? Because bladder warts are carnivorous. Um, there's 11 species known in Michigan and six of them are actually pretty common. Um, and if you look, here's a single leaf of a bladder wart plant. And now you can see what I mean by it being finely divided. Um, it's branch, branch, and branch, and branch, and this is just one leaf, and these are little leaflets um, on a single leaf. The other feature that's super important is these bladders. You can see bladders arranged along the mid vein of this bladder wart leaf. And the bladder wart bladders are the part that's carnivorous. They actually are, have little trap doors on them that are managed by pressure and they have fine trigger hairs. And if you look at them under a microscope, you can actually see if a little microorganism happens to swim by, um, it'll trigger the lid of that bladder, which will pop open, and the pressure change will suck that little microorganism right into the bladder where it's digested by the plant. Um, it's really pretty fascinating. Um, and these bladder warts don't have actual roots. They just kind of float in the water or sit on the bottom um, because they get their nutrients from the organisms they eat in their bladders, that they digest through their bladders. They don't need to have roots in the sediment to get nutrients from the sediment. So it's pretty cool. They're also a green plant, so they do photosynthesize as well. Um, here at the bottom, you can see an image of a bladder wart, one of the larger species underwater. There's a little water celery there behind it in the image. And then they are flowering plants and they produce 
tiny, delicate flowers that are either yellow or purple, depending on the species. Um, they're complex flowers. They almost look like an orchid. Um, and you'll see them poking up um, often among lily pads and uh, in other areas of quiet water. Um, you'll see these tiny yellow or purple flowers poking up and um, it's likely a bladder wart that you're seeing. Here's a couple of the common larger species that you'll see. The one we were just looking at is called common bladderwort. Um, here's what a, a whole plant pulled out of the water looks like. And again, you can see, you know, you might wonder what's, what's stuck all over this plant? Is it, is it little clams? Is it eggs? It's actually the bladders. Um, and another common one that we see in our lakes is um, eastern purple bladderwort. Um, and here's a photo of it underwater. And you can see it's got tons of bladders um, all over the, the leaves there. All right, moving on from bladderworts, um, we have our milfoils. And I'm sure pretty much everyone, if not everyone on uh, the webinar today has heard of water milfoil. Um, they've probably heard of Eurasian water milfoil, the, the extensively spread invasive plant that's caused a lot of problem in a lot of lakes around Michigan and beyond. Um, there's actually eight species of milfoil that are found in Michigan and six of them are native. Um, the one we're seeing on the screen here is native. Um, in general, it shows um, Milfoils tend to have these ro long ropey stems with um, finely divided leaves arranged in whorls, and we'll see some photos of that. Um, and they may also have a short piece that grows up out of the surface of the water um, where the flowers are found. Um, and those, that short piece almost looks a little bit like the uh, waterweed or elodea we looked at a minute ago. Um, but if you look at the plant below the surface, you'll see it's clearly a milfoil. Oops, wrong way. Um, here's a cross section of the stem showing, here's the stem, and you can see it's a whorl of one, two, three, four leaves. And each of these leaves is finely divided into leaflets that come off of a midrib. And so these feather-shaped leaves are characteristic of all of our milfoils that are found in Michigan. Um, so that's the leaf shape to look for. Look for that midrib and then these leaflets coming off the side. Here's the bad one. Here's Eurasian water milfoil. Um, it has those feather-like leaves. And one of the key characteristics of Eurasian milfoil is that it has um, 12 to 21 pairs of those leaflets along the side. So if you were to count these, you'd find it in the range of 12 to 21. Um, they're whorled like all milfoils. Um, the stems tend to be light in color or pinkish, but that's not always the case. I tend to tell people not to rely on color of plants to identify them um, for aquatic plants because the growing conditions can really affect the colors, but there is a good chance they'll have a pinkish or light colored stem. Um, they'll also tend to be really limp when you pull it out of the water. Many of our native milfoils, if you pull them up out of the water, the leaves will stay stiff and kind of poke out from the stem, while milfoil leaves tend to collapse around the stem. Um, here's a comparison down here in the bottom. This one on the right is your Eurasian milfoil with lots of pairs of leaflets. Here on the left, we have northern milfoil. That's a native milfoil, and if I count these, I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pairs of leaflets. That's not enough to be Eurasian milfoil. Now, an important note about Eurasian milfoil is that in recent years, we've discovered that it does hybridize with northern milfoil. So what we end up with is a, um, I've got a gnat in my room here. Okay, uh, we have a, a hybrid that's actually, um, can be very difficult to manage. It can be resistant to certain herbicides, for example. And so, um, and the only way to really tell if you're dealing with Eurasian milfoil or a potential hybrid is to have genetic tests done. Um, luckily, the genetic tests are quite inexpensive to have done, maybe $50 per sample from uh, the colleagues that I work with on this project. Um, but um, it does help you know what you're dealing with because if you're thinking about potentially an herbicide treatment to treat Eurasian milfoil and that you happen to be dealing with a particular hybrid, the herbicide may not work. So it's an important management tool to know exactly what you're dealing with if you're on a lake that's considering um, Eurasian water milfoil management. I wanted to refer and, and show again a native milfoil, variable leaf milfoil. This one is also pretty common, especially in northern Michigan. Um, and it's the photo we saw before. Um, if we zoom in on this area here, um, what a weird thing about variable leaf milfoil and how it got its name is that occasionally you'll see a leaf kind of all by itself 
um, not in a whirl, um, which is a, a kind of an unusual feature for a milfoil. And that's how you know you have the species, variable leaf milfoil. And here's that flowering structure um, that will poke up out of the water sometimes. And at the base, this is what you're seeing. Those are the flowers. They're not very beautiful, but there they are um, for that milf, uh, variable leaf milfoil. This is the other invasive milfoil we have in Michigan. Um, it's not nearly as common or as well known as Eurasian milfoil. It's called parrot feather. Um, and parrot feather is very popular or used to be very popular as a water garden or landscaping plant um, for people who had ornamental ponds um, because it grows a big section of its stem up out of the water. And it's actually kind of pretty. And so um, it, it was regularly found in water gardens. Um, you'll see um, a lot of leaflets there. You can have whorls of up to six leaves on each whorl. Um, and you can see, again, here's a map showing the distribution of where parrot feather has been found around Michigan. Um, happily, we haven't had any reports of it in Northwest Lower Michigan, um, but it's something to be alert for. And let me show you pictures of what it looks like um, in the world. Um, look at it sticking up out of the water. And this is different. This isn't just a flowering spike. This is actually leaves of the milfoil, parrot feather milfoil growing up out of the water. Um, up until, I know even last year, I still found this for sale at some nurseries in the area, um, actually around the Traverse City area, even though it's prohibited to be for sale in Michigan, because unfortunately a problem that we have with nursery plants is that often they're mislabeled. Um, they're labeled under other common names and so forth, and so um, even the seller may not realize that they're offering something that's not supposed to be sold in Michigan. So this is just one to be aware of and keep your eye out for. As you can see, it can grow in very thick beds, and so in places where it has been found, it's, it's quite obvious fairly quickly. I've got a question from Ron. He asks, any opinion on DASH versus chemical treatments? Sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, we could have a whole nother seminar about different ways to manage aquatic plants in lakes. Um, DASH that Ron is referring to is Diver Assisted Suction Harvesting. And this is a non-chemical way of um, removing unwanted plants from an area. Basically, you have a boat, a pontoon boat up at the surface um, with a vacuum pump on it. And then you have divers that dive down to the bottom and hand pull the unwanted plants from the bottom of the lake and send them up a suction tube up to the boat um, where those plants are collected and, and hauled away. Um, it's got some definite advantages in that you can be super selective. A trained diver can recognize native plants versus invasive plants, can remove only the unwanted plants, um, but it's very time consuming as you might imagine. It's a lot of work to do it that way and so it's expensive. And so that's a, a, a trade-off is the expense and time that it takes to do it. But it, if done correctly, it can be very effective, especially for small areas where um, it's actually logistically feasible to do that kind of a, of a plant management. Um, and it also of course has the appeal, you know, uh, people are often concerned about the application of chemicals to lakes and in some cases rightly so. Um, there's a lot of science behind um, the various herbicides that have de been developed for aquatic systems, but some things are very hard to manage. Uh, as I mentioned, Eurasian milfoil, the hybrids, um, are very difficult to manage in some cases with herbicides, and so that's an example where diver-assisted suction harvesting may be a good option. Thank you. All right, we'll move on then. Um, oh, I love this one. This is a milfoil. This is a full-grown milfoil, <laughs> mil, mil, very aphelum tenellum or um, small milfoil. The, it's just evolutionarily, um, it actually has leaves, but they look, they're just like little spikes. It almost looks like tiny asparagus, and it only gets about as big as you see in the photo there, um, growing on the bottom. So I'm not expecting many of us will ever um, notice it when you're out in your lake, but it just it's just one of these things I like to show that shows that nature can be weird sometimes. <laughs> I think um, this, is a, this is a milfoil, one of our native milfoils in Michigan, um, and it's just a very unusual and interesting plant. And every now and then I get somebody sending me pictures going, what the heck is this? And, and they're surprised to learn that it's actually a milfoil. All right. Given what we just learned about milfoils and what they look like, and kind of ignoring that exception of the small milfoil I just showed you, looking at this plant, do you think it's a milfoil or not? Just think about it. Look at the leaf structure, look at the stems, look at the leaf arrangements. 
This is a pretty common Michigan plant. The answer is no, this is not milfoil. It's coontail, uh, a very no, uh, common Michigan plant, a native plant. And the big important thing is the leaves are not feather shaped. Even though they are finely divided, um, they're more of a fork or wishbone shape. They don't have that mid vein and feather like shape as a milfoil. So a lot of times when people see this plant looking, when you look down into the water and don't have it in your hands, you assume it's a milfoil, but it's actually not. This is coontail. Um, it gets its name because the tips of the plant look a little bit like a raccoon's tail. Um, and it's one of several other types of plants that are submerged that have finely divided leaves, but are not milfoils. Here's a couple more that we do sometimes find in our northern Michigan lakes. Um, water marigold and buttercups both have finely divided leaves, uh, are submersed. They do uh, have a flower that will emerge at the surface at the right time of year if you're out there. Water marigold with a nice pretty yellow flower. Buttercups often have a white flower like this. Some, some of them have a yellow. And if we look at their leaves, again, you can see this is definitely not milfoil. Um, here you have branch leaves with no clear mid vein. There's no petioles. And they're actually opposite. This whole thing, oops, let me go back, is one leaf. And this is one leaf, if you were to get right in there closely. Um, and they are opposite. So you, they almost look world here, but they're actually opposite. And then buttercups will have finely branch leaves, but they're alternate. See how you can see there's one leaf coming off here, one leaf, one leaf, one leaf, one leaf, um, right there. So um, those are our water marigolds and our buttercups. So keep an eye out for those pretty flowers um, during the summer. All right. Enough of the under completely submerged underwater plants. Now we're gonna look at some of the floating leaf plants, um, some of which will be familiar and some of them might not be so familiar to you. Um, there's a whole list of them. Um, and of course the ones that come to mind right away are our water lilies, um, but there's also some smaller or even some invasive free floating plants that don't have a root system. They actually completely float and they may have some roots that dangle down into the water, but they're not attached to the lake bottom in any way and they actually will drift around. So we tend to see them only along the edges of lakes or in quiet bays where they're not getting blown all around since they're not rooted. So here's a couple that we see very regularly, right? The yellow water lilies and the white water lilies. And um, it's easy actually to tell, even without flowers, if you're looking at yellow or white water lilies. And if you can tell by looking at the leaves. Um, this leaf is flipped over so you can see the stem um, coming down. But look at how the leaf overall is kind of oval shaped. And then it has two round lobes here. Nice and round. That's your yellow water lily, and there's the familiar flower. Um, the white water lily looks like Pac-Man, right? It's more of a circular leaf with a nice notch with pointed lobes on either side. So in both cases, you have a notch, but this one is rounded. This one is nice and pointy like Pac-Man, and that's your familiar white water lily. So, you know, you can always amaze your friends and let them know that you know the yellow and white water lilies without ever seeing the flowers. These are amazing skills to have for the next pontoon party out on the lake. And if you've ever seen one of these before, um, this is a, actually a photo from an email um, that I got just a few days ago uh, from someone on a Michigan lake that was just had no idea what they were encountering. This weird, big, floating, you know, they referred to it as a monster in their lake. You know, what the heck am I looking at? What am I seeing here? This is actually a yellow water lily root that has come up and floated up to the surface. And it's actually fairly common to see this happen. Um, if, there's, uh, if it's windy out or the bottom is shifting or um, you know, the, a part of the plant has died, this does happen. Um, and also a lot of animals like muskrats feed on the roots and they'll dig them up. And so sometimes you'll see them come floating up. And each of these spots that you see on the root is where a stem used to come up with a leaf, a, a water lily leaf came up from each of those. Um, you can see some old stems here attached in a few places. So if you see one of these scary things floating around in your lake, um, you know, fear not, you're just looking at a water lily root. Here's another common floating leaf plant that we see in our Michigan lakes. It's water shield. Um, it tends to be quite a bit smaller than our water lilies and the leaves are football shaped and the key characteristic is look at this leaf. There's no notch in it at all. Lily pads will always have a notch in them. And this is an entire leaf with no notch in it at all. And if you flip it over, 
Um, you'll see that the stem comes right from the center of the leaf. And another interesting feature, um, if you've ever handled one of these, and if you haven't, I suggest you do, um, go out and feel it, pick one. Um, they're very slimy underneath. Of course, now not, you're not going to go out and pick one, right, because they're slimy, but it's actually pretty interesting. It's like kind of a, a mucus layer that stays attached to the plant, um, and it protects it from insects that might want to eat it and chew on it. It's a protective layer. So on the underneath and even on the stem, um, you'll find this clear layer um, of like a gel on the underside of the water shield, which you'll never see on a lily pad. I have two questions here real quick. Sure. Uh, Carol asked, do white water lilies also have those trunk-like branches? Yes, they do. Yep. And then Ralph asked, why are the water lily leaves so leathery? Are they good for attenuating wave energy? Good question. So um, any floating leaf, um, so water shield like we're seeing here, our lily pads, um, unlike leaves of plants that are completely underwater, they have to have protection from drying out in the sun. So they're going to feel more leathery. Um, some plants, some of the pond weeds that we saw before actually have floating leaves and underwater leaves. And if you look at the whole plant or pick it, the underwater leaves will feel very thin and delicate. And any ones that were floating will feel leathery because they have to resist drying out with the sun hitting them. Um, and so that definitely helps. And then so the second part of the question about whether um, floating leaf plants help with wave energy attenuation, they do. Because um, again, they can provide kind of a layer there on the surface of the water. And when waves come along, you know, those plants that are there, both the leaves and the stems in the water are absorbing some of that wave energy that's coming in. So yes, they, they can definitely help with that. Thanks. Sure. All right, time to throw another invasive species at you. Um, again, this is another one that's not terribly common in Michigan yet, but you can see in the map, we definitely have found it in some of the metropolitan areas. Um, this plant is called yellow floating heart. Um, it has um, a lily pad shaped leaf that doesn't get very big, only about four inches across. Um, and if you look at the photos, you can see they have wavy edges on the leaves. Our native lily pads are nice and smooth. Um, these have wave, wavy edges. And the flower is a yellow five-petaled uh, flower with fringe on it. So it looks very different than the yellow lily pads that we have that are native that almost have like a globe-shaped flower. Um, I'll show another photo of the um, yellow floating heart. This is another plant that has been introduced through uh, the ornamental trade. Um, it's often found in ornamental gardens and used to be sold at nurseries for, for um, planting in, in uh, ornamental ponds. And so um, it has escaped from those areas. And so um, it's a floating leaf plant um, and it can be removed. You see a, a, a um, manager out there in a pond pulling out uh, unwanted yellow floating heart. So this is another invasive plant to, to be alert for. Um, and if you see something you think uh, might be an invasive plant, you can report it to your conservation district, um, reach out to MSU Extension um, or the DNR. Um, any of them would be happy to help you um, confirm what you have and, and get that report turned in. Uh, one more question real quick from Carol. She mm -hmm. asks, can the water lily roots gather sediment and become floating or stable islands? It appears that loons may use this type of island for nesting on their lake. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So um, lily pad roots, if they become uprooted, um, you know, sometimes they'll have sediment with them um, and become kind of a floating island in, in the lake or think, you know, plant material and, and sediment will gather around it. So yeah, that certainly can happen. Um, there's also other um, like uh, sphagnum moss or other um, materials in lakes that sometimes kind of come loose and become floating islands. And yeah, they are valued by loons as, as nesting habitat. And then Ralph asks, will the high water levels in our inland lakes currently affect the distribution of floating leaf plants in the lakes? Ah, so, you know, floating leaf plants have to be able to reach the surface, right? So if they're a rooted plant, like a lily pad, um, they have to be able to reach the surface. And there's a, there's a depth below which um, the uh, lily pad will no longer attempt to grow a stem long enough to reach the surface and grow those leaves. And so what we may see if we have um, periods of, extended periods of high water levels, is that some of the original um, floating leaf, like lily pad beds, may just be 
in too much water. The water may be too deep there. Um, and you may see them, you know, moving towards the kind of new shallow area in the lake. Um, so that can certainly happen. Um, if you have a, a floating leaf plants that are not rooted, they just float freely in the lake. And so they'll just go to the edge of the lake wherever the wind blows them. So it's kind of um, regardless of what the um, lake level is. Good question. All right, here's another floating leaf plant. And this is a super tiny floating leaf plant. Um, and as a group, we tend to call them duckweeds. And sometimes people will look at a, a, a mass of duckweed on a, a lake surface and think that it's algae. Um, but it's actually not, it's a rooted plant. Here's a picture of one. You can see it's three little leaves, little roots hanging down. And um, they are very small. Um, you know, as you can see here, here's a picture of one and it's not even an inch from including the leaves and all the roots. These are very small plants, um, and, uh, but they're also very valuable. They're called duckweed for a reason. Ducks and other waterfowl will cruise along with their mouths open along the surface of the water and just shovel this stuff in. Um, they, they really um, rely on it as a food source, um, and they're a, they're a beneficial plant um, for, for our lakes, but, and they're actually not algae, so that's something else to keep an eye out for. If you see what at first might look like a green scum on the surface, take a look and see if it's actually little tiny um, floating leaf plants. And another invasive I'm going to share with you. This one is European frogbit. And this is one that I'm particularly concerned about um, because, uh, take a look at the map here. Um, for quite a long time, it's been known along kind of the Lake Huron, Lake St. Clair side of Michigan. And um, was found in a lot of those, still is found in, in these areas and in connecting waterways, wetlands, and so forth. Um, it's recently, however, has been moving. Um, it was found in an inland lake in the Grand Rapids area a couple of years ago, and then just last summer was found at the mouth of the Grand River in Grand Haven and also in Pentwater Lake over here. It's being moved by boats, and so um, this will create, um, it's got small floating leaves. It will create mats, solid mats on the surface of lakes, um, and will shade out the original native plants that were growing below. Um, it can be a real problem. Um, and here's an example of it growing alongside lily pads. So you can see how big lily pads are. Um, European frogbit, the leaves are much smaller. And I'm going to go back to the previous slide. Um, it will grow um, these small white flowers with three petals that are quite quite evident, but the leaves are not much bigger than like a half dollar, a quarter to a half dollar. And they connect. So you'll have a plant here and then it'll shoot a little stem over here and grow another one. So if you go to pull one out, you might get a bushel of them because they're all connected. So that in some ways makes management easier because it can be hand pulled and removed and it's not rooted to the bottom. They're just floating the roots dangle down into the water. Um, but this is another one that, that we're asking people to be alert for because it's clearly hopping around Michigan, um, probably on trailered boats. There's that fo photo again. And then I'm going to um, kind of wrap up this section with a couple of other um, ornamental plants that have escaped into um, the wild. This is water hyacinth. Um, this one is actually one of two, and we'll look at the second one in a moment, that although we know it can be potentially invasive in Michigan, you can still buy it at a nursery. It's still legal to own this plant. Um, but what we don't want is for it to escape into the wild. So it's, you can see it's a very unusual plant shape. Um, inflated petiole, waxy, shiny leaves with a gorgeous purple flower. So you can see why people enjoy it in a, in a um, pond environment. Um, it's free floating. The leaves just hang down into the water like uh, frogbit does. And um, here's a photograph of it. Again, you can see the beautiful purple flowers, the thick um, petioles. Um, this is another one that we definitely want to know about if you see it in the wild. Again, you know, it's, it's okay for people to have it in their own you know, water gardens or flower pots. That's fine, but we don't want it getting out because it grows very quickly and it's very difficult to kill, which is why people love having it in their pond. Not only is it beautiful, it's really easy to grow. Um, we sometimes get reports about this plant, 
and people are concerned that it's water hyacinth. Um, but this one is a really common emergent plant of our Michigan lakes. This is pickerel weed. Um, if you look at the leaves, they look very different. You have a stem and a nice kind of almost arrow or um, a spade shaped leaf, um, a stalk coming out with a little purple flower. So if I go back, you can see the difference in the, in the leaf shape between hyacinth and pickerel weed. The other um, invasive plant that you can still have in your water garden is water lettuce. Uh, it's another free-floating um, plant. It's been found in a number of places in Michigan, um, as you can see by the map. Um, and uh, it's very, it's kind of weird. <laughs> it's a weird plant because it has these kind of fuzzy leaves. They're thick, they're fuzzy and ridged, uh, almost look like big fat green, um, like ruffled potato chips to me. Um, here is some pictures of the plant itself. Um, again, very popular, grows really fast, um, hard to kill it, um, free floating plant that's been found um, repeatedly, especially in urban areas. You know, the more people we have, the more ornamental plants we have escaping. So another one to keep an eye out for. I have a question from Richard. He mm -hmm. asks, is pickerel weed used by pike for egg deposition? You bet. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I said, I didn't, I wasn't going to spend a lot of time talking about the emergent plants, but yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons it's got its name pickerel weed, pickerels and pikes. Um, they spawn in um, wetland areas and marshes where these emergent plants are abundant and in shallows along the edges of lakes. And yes, um, they, they provide good um, cover for nesting pike and pickerel. All right, now we're just going to wrap up with a few interesting oddities. Um, I wanted to um, feature some of the macroalgae, um, one native and one invasive, um, muskgrass. This is everywhere, and it's a good guy. Um, you often find it growing on the, on the bottom of lakes, especially in sandy lakes. Um, if you've Pull it up. It, it looks like a regular rooted plant, except for it doesn't have any true root stems or leaves. These are this is actually an algae, but a very complex algae and a big algae. Um, when you pull it out, it'll feel stiff or crunchy in your hands, and it will also be kind of stinky. That's why we call it muskgrass, especially if you break it up in your hands and you take a sniff. Um, some people think it smells bad or kind of skunky. I think it smells like lake, right? It smells like what would have, smell like if you pull your your um, anchor up from the lake bottom. Um, it is a really excellent um, species for keeping the sediment and silt in the bottom of a lake stable and keeping the water clear. It's a really excellent um, plant for that. And um, it also provides cover for the invertebrates and other little creatures that live in the lake bottom. So this is a, this is a desirable plant. Unfortunately, <laughs> I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't talk about the invasive counterpart. Um, this is starry stonewort. Um, starry stonewort is marching its way north uh, in Michigan. Um, we're not seeing a lot of it up here yet, but it's in Higgins Lake and it's in um, several other popular recreational lakes um, in central Michigan. Um, and this is another macroalgae, um, but it's different. And the main thing that's different compared to muskgrass is these stars. Um, they're called bulbils, which is a reproductive structure. Um, and they look like little white stars. And you can see how small they are. Here's one on a fingertip. And they grow on clear filaments, kind of on the underside of the algae. So if you were to pull some up, you may, if you flip it over, that's what's been done here, you can find these white stars. Um, it will not feel crunchy or be smelly like muskgrass is. Muskgrass will never have stars on it, ever. Um, and also the branchlets, which is what we call these things that almost look like leaves on macroalgae, will be much longer and uneven. Um, if we go back and look at um, cara or muskgrass, it tends to be quite short. The branchlets are all about the same length. And if we go back to starry stonewort, you can see they're just, it's, it looks messy when you pull it up. It's just a tangled mess um, when you pull it up. Um, you can crush the stem uh, structures in your fingers. And, uh, but again, those stars are really important to look for. And this stuff, we still haven't quite figured out how to kill it. Um, there's some uh, chemical treatments that will knock it back, um, but it can grow very thick. And those thick beds 
of starry stonewort, it's difficult for any um, treatment, like a copper treatment that often works against other algae, to get in there and really do a good job. So this is a really tough one. So um, we know, like many others, it tends to be spread by trailered boats. And so this is another kind of a poster child for the importance of keeping boats and gear um, clean, drained, and dried um, before moving it to another water body. And now we're going to talk about something that isn't a plant at all, um, sponges. Um, these photos are actually of sponges um, that I photographed in Spring Lake, um, which is connected to Fife Lake right up here in Northwest Michigan. Um, these are, um, uh, you know, a lot of people are surprised to learn we have sponges that live in our inland lakes. Um, they're not just an ocean creature. And so um, these are all sponges growing here on the bottom. Um, and there, you can see sponges in a number of different shapes, but this is really the most common that we'll see in our area. Um, they'll look kind of like green fingers. And if you look at closely, like this one here in a pan, you can see, um, you could even, if, if I zoomed in even more, which I can't right now, you'd see almost little spikes or spicules because sponge has almost a silica or glass-like material, little um, spines in it that keep its structure rigid. So if you touch it or squeeze it, it feels a little bit crunchy. And that's because there's all these little silicone needles in it actually. They, they don't poke you but you can feel the, the structure of them. So these are fascinating um, creatures that live in uh, not all of our lakes but they're probably more common than we realize and sometimes you'll find them coating a stick or a stone that you see uh, or pull up from a, a lake bottom. So this is just another kind of cool lake creature to keep your eyes out for. And then finally one more that I'll share is bryozoans. Um, these aren't plants at all. Um, they're actually little microorganisms that grow in colonies. Um, and every year I get some calls from people who say, what in the world is growing on my dock, on the bottom of my pontoon? Um, you know, sometimes these colonies, the one you see in a hand um, was actually found on the bottom of a pontoon. That's actually a pontoon in the back of the photo you see here. They had their pontoon in the water all summer. They pulled it out and found these big globs growing on the bottom and we're concerned about an invasive species. Bryozoans are actually a sign of good water quality. They require clear, healthy lakes. Um, they're a filter feeder, so they need, you know, not a lot of silt and sediment and junk in the water. Um, and they will grow often in these big blobs that can get quite large, much larger than this one, or they will grow on surfaces like this and almost be a ropey or snaky shape. Um, I believe this was actually a photo that Carol sent to me from Spider Lake, a dock that was pulled out of there. So um, bryozoans are weird, but they're great. <laughs> They're a sign of good water quality. Um, and so if you happen to find one, um, that's a good sign. It's good news. I got a question real quick from Ron. He sure. asks, we are doing a complete lake-wide aquatic plant survey in 2020. Can you recommend a reproducible protocol for collections such as GPS grid using a rake diving? that could be useful for our lake, but also for statewide surveying. We have good background in aquatic vascular plants and freshwater phycology. All right, yeah. So again, I could do a whole, a whole class on ways to survey lakes for plants. Um, and as, as Ron mentioned, it does depend on, you know, your level of comfort and the, uh, with plant ID and also with how much time and, and person power you have to put into it. So, um, we, um, I'm involved with our volunteer lake monitoring program, and in that, in those cases, we use um, rake tosses. And you'll see in a minute, I'm going to show a photo of the rakes that our volunteers use to um, toss off the side of a boat to collect plants. Um, and we have a protocol for that that's that's semi quantitative, um, that looks at the density of plants across the lake. We also have a more basic one um, that is just to generally just look for invasive plants and not document everything there. So there's a protocol there that's um, very kind of citizen friendly. Um, and then you can get even more advanced. So um, the state of Michigan tends to use a survey called the AVAS survey, um, which is based on um, boating kind of in a, go, weaving back and forth across the um, zone in a lake where, plant, where it's shallow enough for plants to grow and doing a combination of observation and rake tosses from the boat. Um, and often, and collecting the location information with GPS. Um, there's a third uh, approach called a point intercept survey, where before you go out, you take a map of the lake and you basically make a grid of points all over the lake, figure out the GPS coordinates for each of them, 
take your boat right to each of those points and document what plants are found at each of those points. Um, again, typically using a rake toss um, method. And that gives you maybe the most quantitative, um, you know, measurement of the, the density of the different kinds of plants in your lake, um, but it's also the most labor and time intensive. Um, diving can also be used to augment um, collection from a boat using a rake. Um, if you have people that are, are comfortable and, and qualified to do diving for plants, um, that makes it easy to make sure you're not missing anything. But again, that adds again to the amount of time and effort and expertise that you need to do it. So um, yeah, there's a lot of those methods out there and I'd be happy to share offline um, links to those protocols too. Thanks. Sure. All right. So we all love aquatic plants now, especially the native ones. Um, so I want to end with a couple of suggestions or recommendations of things you can do to protect aquatic plants. Um, this is especially true if you're a um, property owner along a, a lake, but can go for anyone who uses or recreates on our lakes. Um, we want to protect our native plants. So um, we want to uh, minimize the disturbance of the aquatic plants as much as we can. Um, we want to keep our shorelines as natural as possible and by leaving the plants in the water, um, natural shorelines are easier to maintain as opposed to uh, feeling the need to install a seawall, for example, to control erosion. Um, get out there and enjoy them if you like to swim, dive, snorkel, or even just fish. Um, that helps you appreciate the, the value of our aquatic plants in our lakes. Um, and, you know, manage invasive species. Uh, the most important way to manage invasive species is to not let them in at all. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, when I talk about keeping shorelines native and, and keeping plants as undisturbed as possible, what I'm showing you here is the opposite of that, right? It's a photograph showing um, seawalls on every lot, no native plants um, on the shoreline, and there's unlikely to be many plants under the water, even though you can't see. Um, and you know, this aren't, these aren't situations where native plants are going to thrive. And I'm guessing if you went out there and tried to fish, you wouldn't have much luck um, because the habitat has been um, removed essentially from the lake. Um, we know, for those of you who like data, I'll sh throw up a quick chart, um, we know that um, an undeveloped lake, that's the green bars, you have plenty of cover of emergent floating and submergent plants, but in developed lakes, what we tend to see is only about 5% of the lake will have cover of aquatic plants. And you can imagine if you drop from 17 or so percent cover of any given type of plant down to only 4 or 5% cover, you've just lost a big chunk of your habitat in that lake. So um, it's important when we're thinking about living on lakes, developing on lakes, to think about how we can best preserve the aquatic plants in the lake in that process. Um, there's a lot of things that we see. I showed one photo of, of uh, shorelines where people had managed them. Um, you may be able to see, this is kind of an old photo, but you can see these circles um, under the water around people's docks where people have used something called um, a weed roller that um, kind of pivots around and rolls around basically crushing the plants to keep plants down in an area. And, you know, it's okay to maintain a clear lane around your dock so you can get your boat in or out or you want to be able to swim in front of your property Property, that's fine. But as you can see, if especially on this side of the photo, someone has been moving their weed roller all along to basically get rid of all the plants along that area. And that's probably a lot more disturbance than was really necessary to enjoy um, the recreational uses that we want to have. Um, the same kind of thing goes to herbicide treatment or any other kind, even dash removal of aquatic plants, is thinking about where do we really want and need uh, plant management and where can we live with them so that the lake can and stay healthy and, and maintain good habitat. Um, I talked about stopping invasive species. Um, Extension and our other partners do a lot of work um, working with the public, boaters and anglers to make sure they're keeping their boats and gear clean. And that's especially important now. Um, this summer, there may not be as many uh, crews out there offering free boat washes in the area because of COVID-19, but it's still important, um, even if you don't have someone there to wash your boat for you, to make sure that people remember to clean, drain and dry um, your boats. And it's actually the law here in Michigan started um, last year. Um, you, it's actually illegal to drive around with um, 
weeds on your trailer, um, to move weeds from one place to another. Um, it's even illegal technically to drive around without pulling the drain plug out of your boat or moving any water like in a bait bucket or in a cooler full of fish from the lake to some other location. You've got to get rid of that because there's a good chance that there are plants or seeds or plant fragments or even things like zebra mussel larvae in that water. And so it's important to um, make sure you're, you're being a good citizen and kind of doing a leave no trace approach approach to boating. The same goes for um, those ponds and water gardens and aquariums. Um, Michigan has a statewide program called Ripple that offers guidance on um, how to, you know, do those hobbies responsibly. You know, reminding us that if you can't keep your aquarium anymore, to not go take it down to the lake and release it. Um, and to not, uh, if you have a water garden, you know, build it far away from a natural waterway so there's no chance that if you decide to put a few pretty water hyacinths in that pond, they won't end up in the lake or in the river near your home. Um, I mentioned our citizen monitoring program. Uh, Michigan has a statewide volunteer lake and stream monitoring program called the Michigan Clean Water Corps, or my Corps for short. Um, it's on hiatus this year, but we'll be back in 2021. Um, it's one of the oldest lake monitoring programs in the nation. And um, part of that program is plant monitoring programs like our exotic aquatic plant watch. And um, there's a photo of a, a volunteer using a rake that we talked about where you take a couple rake heads and attach them together and and tie them to a rope. They do a great job collecting aquatic plants. Um, this is even, you know, I professionally, this is how I collect plants. If I'm not diving for them, I'm pulling them out with a rake. And so um, this is a great way to go out and even just explore the plants in your lake. And if you want to get involved with the Exotic Aquatic Plant Watch, we actually still are offering it this summer. Um, you can sign up through May 30th and the link to get involved will be shared um, after, the, after the webinar or you can contact me directly for that. Um, it provides some training and a pro protocol for monitoring your lake for invasive plants. And I know a number of our lakes in the area are already involved. Um, and one more uh, opportunity that I definitely want to promote to you is the 2020 Michigan Inland Lakes Convention. Um, we've done this, this will be our fourth biennial, so every two years we do this convention. Um, this will be the first year we're going to do it completely online. It'll be September 16, 17, and 18, um, and it'll be on Zoom just like this webinar here, um, hosted by MSU Extension and a number of other partners, um, and so um, this will be an opportunity this fall, and you'll surely hear more about this. We'll work with a lot of the local organizations and lake associations to get the word out about um, the convention this fall. So that wraps up. That's my last slide. Again, there's my contact information. You're welcome to reach out to me at any time if you have questions about aquatic plants. I am based here in Traverse City area, so um, I'm pretty familiar with lakes in this area, but I've worked uh, in a lot of uh, regions around uh, Michigan and beyond, so um, I'm happy to answer questions, respond to emails or, or phone messages if you want to follow up about anything we talked about today. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back over to Luke. Alrighty, thank you, Joe. Um, if anybody has any more questions, please feel free to send them in the chat box. I did have one from Ralph for Joe, and he asked, how is climate change affecting the distribution of native or invasive aquatic plants in our lakes? That's a really good question. And interestingly, there hasn't been a lot of research done on that. Um, what we are, we have seen information on the impacts of climate change overall in our lakes. Um, some of the things we're seeing is that we're not seeing ice last as long on our lakes across the Midwest. Um, so there's definitely a difference in the, in the ice patterns. We're seeing warming temperatures, especially in the shallows and the surface of lakes. Um, we're seeing changes there um, for sure. Uh, it's, it's documentable with data. Um, and so, and then of course we're seeing more extreme storm events. So we're seeing when it does rain, we're getting more rain. When it's windy, we're getting more wind. You know, we're seeing these things be, be more extreme. It's resulting in things like high water levels. It could relate, result in low water levels um, in the future. And so we're seeing more fluctuations. Now, logic would tell us that that's going to impact the distribution of aquatic plants, um, both native and invasive. And it may make, um, uh, give some plants an advantage that didn't have those advantages before. And um, people are just starting to look to see specifically how aquatic plants may be um, 
affected by that. One thing we do know is that a lot of the invaders that we know of, uh, aquatic invadive, invasive species, plants like hydrilla, plants like water lettuce and water hyacinth, um, they thrive in, in warmer conditions. Um, they do fine here, but they thrive in warmer conditions. So if we're seeing less ice, if we're seeing warmer temperatures, there's a chance that some of these invasive plants will have a more competitive advantage over our native plants in the future. So all the more reason for us to be vigilant about introducing any new species into our lakes. And then Richard asks, what is the maximum depth at which plants stabilize sediment? Ooh. There's a number of features in that question. So, you know, there's the question of how deep plants can grow in a lake. And then there's how, when is that helpful in stabilizing sediment? Um, basically, anywhere they are, they're helping with that um, at any depth. Of course, the deeper you go, the less likely that surface waves are going to impact sediments at 15, 20, 25 feet. Um, they can still help um, with the turbulence that could be caused by um, power boats, for example, um, that those waves and that turbulence may go a little bit deeper. Um, so they're always providing a benefit, um, but it's most pronounced in the shallows because that's where the wave energy is the most pronounced and most likely that the energy of those waves is actually coming up against the lake bottom. And so that's where we see the, the biggest um, benefit of rooted plants in protecting the sediment from disturbance. Thank you. And I suppose with that, if I will sh share my screen on our ending screen here and uh, give it back to Carol. Um, there, Carol, I've asked you to unmute. It should show up on your screen. There you go. Okay. And then ac actually, um, let's start off with Patty as she has a special thank you for our speaker. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Patty Hersberger and I'm part of the Spider Lake, Runny Lake team that helped organize the poll series. We're glad that you joined us today and hope we were able to share some information that is new to you. We're fortunate to have Dr. Lattimore with us today in webinar format and appreciate her sharing not only her time, but also her vast knowledge of aquatic vegetation that's so very vital to lake health. So this year to show our appreciation, the team would like to present Joe with this year's advice from a late t-shirt <laughs> oh how great <laughs> yeah from your true nature store also nice. we purchased a tree and that will be that was donated and will be planted in a deserving area so the oh. poem on this year's shirt says i don't think you can read it be clear make positive ripples look beneath the surface stay calm shore up friendships, and take time to reflect. Be full of life. Thank you so much. That's You'll great. Thank you. Thank you so mail. much. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll send that back to Carol. Thanks, Patty, and thanks, Joe. Wow, I learned a lot about underwater forests. I hope you did too. Despite some of their names, the aquatic plants that make up those forests aren't weeds. Rather, they're vital organisms in our water ecosystems. Ralph, Patty, and I hope you join us again for the next poll's presentations on June 27th and August 15th. The June presentation will focus on how changes in climate have impacted fisheries. Fish, like the plants, flourish in specific environments, and when those change, well, well, to find out what happens, register to attend the next polls presentation by going to the Grand Traverse Conservation District website. And while you're there registering, please consider making a donation that will help support the Conservation District's work to bring informative 
webinars, and other programs to you, such as our poll series. Finally, in the tradition of our poll series, here's a takeaway thought taken directly from that advice from the lake t-shirt. The next time you enjoy the waters of our splendid earth, look beneath the surface and be clear in your thoughts about the importance of those underwater forest plants. Then vow to protect and support them. Together, our efforts will make positive ripples. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you to the U.S. men and women veterans who've given their lives for our freedoms. We hope you all enjoy your Memorial Day weekend. Be sure to check your email for follow-ups from the Grand Traverse Conservation District for all those wonderful links that Joe uh, will provide and also for a link for the recording of this informative program. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Bye. Thank you again, everyone. Thanks, everyone.